today we're going to be talking about chapter four, and it's called The Civilization of the Greeks. Um, you know, just personally, one of my favorite chapters in the course. Uh, this is a, a painting of one of the famous leaders of ancient Greek history. His name is Pericles. Uh, during a terrible time in Greek history known as the Peloponnesian War. And so we know so much about this war and about this person um, because of an early historian named Thucydides. And when we learn about ancient history, you know, like back to chapter one, uh, a lot of the subjects and people that we're talking about are coming from written records. Um, but Sometimes you have to dig a little, consult multiple sources. You can't always trust written records from antiquity. Thucydides is unique in that he tells a pretty balanced story. So if you ever read his History of the Peloponnesian War, it's, it's really good. So I want to start by thinking about where Greece is, what it looks like, and why that matters. So the geography of Greece... The fact that it is an archipelago, meaning, well, there's the Hellespont, which is a peninsula that looks like an upside down hand. And then there are hundreds of islands around it um, in the Mediterranean. So, uh, so much of the English language comes from Greek. Um, in fact, the, the Mediterranean is Greek for Middle Earth. Um, so if you're a Tolkien fan, but... Um, it just means middle of the world. They saw themselves as the center of the world like a lot of ancient people did. Now, the earliest Greeks uh, were a group known as the Minoans, and they are like the mother culture. So if you ever think of the mother culture in Central America, it's the Olmecs. Uh, the mother culture uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's the Bantu. Uh, and when I'm talking about that, I'm just saying like when you look at uh, the spoken Greek language today, a lot of it harkens back to uh, this language that the Minoans spoke. Um, so they were a trading-based empire, meaning that even prior to written records, we find their stuff everywhere. They were all over the place. Um, their capital was centered on an island called Crete, and their capital city uh, was a place called Gnosis. And uh, the root there, it it's the same root of the word knowledge. Um, so the concept of knowledge uh, comes from this ancient city called Gnosis. Now, the first Greek city-state, that is the first people who were calling themselves Greeks, who were speaking the Greek language, um, were a group known as the Mycenaeans. And so they migrated in. They were part of this huge people group called the Indo-Europeans, and they migrated into... Uh, the Hellespont or the Peloponnesus, or really just the mainland of Greece, uh, the upside down hand, I keep thinking of it that way. Uh, their most famous leader was a man named Agamemnon. And if you've read the Iliad or Brad Pitt did a great version of the Iliad with the movie Troy. Um, of course, the movie took some liberties, but honestly, so did Homer. Um, you know, if you ever read it and his account, it's very embellished. You know, for example, if you ever uh, watch the movie 300 about the Spartans, you know, don't worry too much about historical accuracy because the work that it's based on from Herodotus was also rather embellished. I mean, when you're reading ancient history, figuring out what actually happened is really tricky. <laughs> you have to consult multiple sources, and sometimes they're all lying. So you sometimes have to dig into artifacts and archaeology to actually figure out what's going on. So, for example, when Herodotus wrote that the Persian army invading Greece had five million people. I mean, honestly, <laughs> maybe there were five million people in the whole Persian Empire. Big question mark. So he's probably lying, but most people did back then. So anyway, when Homer told the story of Agamemnon, this powerful warlord who united all the Greek-speaking peoples, and then invaded the city of Troy. And of course, you know, there's this really cool romantic story. Um, the main theme is the love that launched a thousand ships. Someone from Troy was dating someone from Greece that they weren't supposed to. It started a war um, that was devastating to both civilizations. So Agamemnon is the famous king 
of Mycenae. But Mycenae was destroyed around 1190 BCE, so we'll move on. Speaking of geography, it helps to look at a map. And as you can see, there is the upside down hand, you know, the mainland of Greece, uh, but then also the largest island there, which is called the Peloponnesus. And so, you know, this is called the Hellespont, you know, the big upside down hand. And then this little peninsula, which is connected, is called the Peloponnesus. So the two main city states, uh, there's several I'm sure that you've heard of, uh, but the two most famous are the city state of Athens and the city state of Sparta. Um, but depending on how well you know the New Testament, you may recognize some of these like Corinth or Ephesus. Um, you know, um, I, I encourage you sometime to read um, a story called the Melian Debate. And uh, it's, it's the first essay I do with my freshmen. And it's just a fascinating dialogue about some of the moral and ethical issues, um, honestly, going back to right and wrong. So it's a great subject dealing with an island that is so small, it doesn't even get named on this map. So we're gonna zoom in just a little bit and look at this tiny little peninsula called the Peloponnesus. And so south of that, you can see this island called Crete, and there's the main city of the Minoans called Gnosis. So the Greek Dark Age, when Mycenae was destroyed and the Greeks had moved in, uh, there was a lot of movement of peoples. Um, there was a lot of uh, movement outward of peoples, um, but there's not a lot of writing um, that comes from this time of 1100 to 750 BCE. So this is known as the Greek Dark Age. And it was during this period um, that Homer's works were based. So it was during this, uh, not prehistoric, but during a time that we don't have any written records. So Homer's telling the story of the invasion of Troy. And so it is loosely based on a true story. There were Greek speaking peoples who invaded the city of Troy, uh, which is a city um, on the west coast of what is today Turkey. Uh, who were also Greek-speaking peoples. And the city of Troy, in fact, had been destroyed about seven different times. Um, but it wasn't this dramatic story uh, like what you're seeing play out here, this clip of Achilles and Hector fighting. Um, again, great movie. I always enjoy it. Uh, but, you know, whether it's accurate or not, that's up to you. Um, but what it does give us is a glimpse of some of the Greek values. You know, because the sequel to it, written also by Homer of the Odyssey, is about a king of another one of the tiny islands called Ithaca named Odysseus, who took 20 years to get home from this war. And both stories really emphasize heroic values, virtue and discipline and honor. So, for example, in this scene, Hector knew he would die facing Achilles but he was honor bound to go out and face him. 
Of course, the Trojan War, the actual war, was fought between this Mycenaean kingdom, a united Greek people under Agamemnon, against this city of Troy in around 1200 BCE. And like I said, you, you have to take Homer or Herodotus or any of these ancient writers, you've got to take them with a grain of salt. You know, so when you read any ancient writings for that fact, uh, are they entirely true? You know, Socrates gave us some brilliant philosophical thoughts. Or was it Plato writing under a pseudonym? Huh. Still great thoughts, which we'll get to in just a moment. So, of course, the climax of the Iliad, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with this symbol of the Trojan horse. Um, the Greeks could not defeat the mighty city of Troy, even though their hero Hector was killed by Achilles. So they made a horse, they put all the bad guys inside, they presented it as a gift, and then it was eventually opened up. So I just wanted to show you just, just how many popular works of art, of movies, of media are associated with Greek culture. Um, because really the, the Greeks have influenced our lives in so many different ways. So this is a painting of Hector, Car or, excuse me, Achilles carrying Hector's head um, around the city of Troy. According to the Eliot, he rode around in a chariot carrying his head seven times. <sighs> Couldn't help myself. Again, just it's all over the place. Yeah, again. So moving on, um, this is what one of the city-states of Greece looks like today. This is the island of Scalopagus, and you see these beautiful whitewashed buildings. And so if you visit Greece, which again is, is big on my bucket list, I particularly want to see the city of Athens. Um, these are the types of buildings you'll see. So next, I want to look at um, how these city-states were organized. So the concept of a city-state, an autonomous political unit, is not unique. I mean, we saw that with the Mesopotamians. Uh, the Chinese used this. It really is just a gathering of people for mutual benefit and safety. Uh, but typically, these city-states were limited in size and population by their resources. So we can't have cities of millions, we can't have nations, um, because there just weren't enough resources to go around. And so because of that, people were constantly attacking one another to steal goods, food, domesticated animals, whatever they could steal. And so because of that, people grouped together for protection and, and built walls around their dwellings and then farmed in the fields surrounding the walls. And then the bad guys come, they attack the city-state, burn all the farms, but the people are safe in the walls. So the Greeks called this a polis. And a polis is just the Greek word for city-state. Um, 
we still use this word in some cases. Some so, some large cities, like you know, the city from Superman is called Metropolis. Um, that just means large dwelling place, large city. Um, now, the Greeks, in terms of their military, had a number of unique tactics um, that are still used by modern militaries. For example, uh, the concept of the phalanx, um, that the Greeks would fight as a team, and that they would train as a team, and that they would move as a team, and they would conduct maneuvers under fire as a team. Um, all this is central to not only the Greek military, um, but their entire military strategy. Uh, so if you ever look at, I don't know if you played the game, any of the Total War games, but if you ever uh, use Greek infantry in any type of simulation, they move in squares uh, with shields all around them, with spears poking out. And then each hoplite, a uh, hoplite is just their name for citizen soldier, uh, would carry an additional sword along with the long shield. And so working as a team, they can be very effective this way. So this is what the Acropolis, uh, which is just the Greek word for fortified hilltop, uh, looks like today. And this is from the city of Athens. This is a, uh, a temple to Erechtheon. Uh, I'm going to try to, I, I just butchered that, but Erechtheon, I think. Uh, so... Uh, Greek architecture, I just wanted to point out with this photograph, um, is, is rather important and uh, rather influential. Okay, so between 750 and 550 BCE, uh, there were large numbers of Greeks leaving their homeland, settling in distant lands. Um, this was partly because of a massive gulf between the rich and the poor. Um, very little of Greek, Greece's land is actually suitable for farming. You know, much of it looks like the photograph of the whitewashed buildings I showed you. Mountains and the sea are the two biggest defining geographic characteristics of Greece, the mountains and the sea. So it's not really conducive to large farms, meaning that the Greek mainland can't actually support large numbers of people. So, if a family had a lot of children, many of them would wind up moving away. You know, for much the same reason, if you grew up in a small town and there aren't the opportunities you were hoping for, you'll likely leave the small town and go somewhere else and pursue your career. It's very similar in Greece. You know, if there aren't opportunities there, then they're going to move and they're going to settle and they're going to colonize all over the place. So, each colony viewed themselves as an independent nation. So for example, Athens alone was responsible for colonizing so many different places, including the island of Milos, including the island of Ithaca, and they colonized all of these places 
And while each of these places considered themselves independent states, they still considered Athens their mother polis. So colonization creates a greater sense of Greek identity in that while many of these islands often fought amongst each other, many of the Greeks often fought amongst each other, they spoke a similar language, they had a common history, and they have a similar culture. And so while the Greeks didn't always get along, their culture spread all over the Mediterranean world. So this also leads to more trade and industry. Um, it, you know, as far back as the time of the Minoans, you can find Greek artifacts all over the Mediterranean world. Um, you know, Greek pottery, uh, and the Greeks did a, a, a large degree of trade in wine, olive oil, uh, in return for food, metals, fish, timber, things they couldn't get themselves. Um, so, point is, these folks were all over the place. A little about Greek politics. So, when the Greeks use the word tyrant, they're not always thinking about it the way we do. You know, we think of tyrant, we think of dark lord, dictator, bad guy in every movie. Uh, it's someone who seizes power. And the Greeks considered that as well. Um, but they thought that there were circumstances necessary where someone would need to seize power, particularly in times of crisis. Well, of course, you know, we're a constitutional republic. We have written into the Constitution these emergency powers that the president can assume in a time of crisis. And so we really developed that policy from the Greek model, where instead of them having it written into a constitution, someone would just rise up <laughs> and say, come with me if you want to live. And everybody would go, okay. Because uh, meanwhile, uh, many of these Greek city-states were ruled by groups. And these groups couldn't always agree. And you know, even in Athens, which practiced um, one of the only examples of pure democracy, uh, where every citizen could vote on every issue. But the problem with that, just like the problem Congress is having, is they can't seem to agree on things. And so if a crisis would occur, like for example, Persians invaded, or a civil war were to break out, then someone like Pericles could rise up and say, I'm gonna fix this. So it did not necessarily mean that they're bad guys in the Greek sense, that we don't use the word tyrant kindly uh, in today's world. But now, um, not only did it give rise to tyrants, this massive movement and migration created new opportunities, not only for the wealthy, um, but for a new rich who had made their money in trade and industry, and even opportunities for the poor who were able to rise up. So there was a great deal of social mobility in the Greek world. Now, the practice of viewing tyrants as saviors of, of humanity uh, began to dwindle um, around the 6th century BCE. I mean, really, you know, ideally someone heroically stands up to help people and to save people and then heroically steps down when the crisis is over. We know that's not how it works in reality, and, uh, and I think they figured that out the hard way. Um, but while this practice of large groups of people making decisions uh, with the occasional tyrant to fix things in a crisis um, eventually evolved into more sophisticated government structures. And one of these, again in Athens, uh, was the opportunity for citizens to participate um, in public discussions and debates through the forum. But we've been talking mostly about ancient Athens. So let's look at a society that lived a very different way, and that's Sparta. And so you're probably somewhat familiar with Sparta. It's a city state in the southern part of Greece, and um, they ruled a region called Laconia. And so if you look at, go back to the map, upside down hand, the southernmost large body of land 
is called Laconia, and that's where Sparta um, dwelled and ruled. This is a fascinating group of people that I would never want to meet, but I like reading about. They were a warrior society. That was their life. Spartan boys would enter the military at the age of six, and they would go and live in the barracks their whole lives until the age of 32. And so from six to 32, they were either training or they were fighting in battles. And at the age of 32, if they were still alive, they could retire and become farmers. And it was a very rigid society. I mean, it's, it's the best example of ancient totalitarianism. You know, every Spartan boy did this. Every Spartan girl was encouraged to have as many babies as possible to fuel the war machine. They didn't busy themselves with farming because they had made slaves of all the surrounding people. They called these people helots, just their word for slave. And so the helots did all the work, the, slave, the Spartans did all the fighting. Until, like many cases in history, the helots outnumbered the Spartans so greatly they eventually rose up. The Spartans barely suppressed the rebellion and they had to make severe changes to their society uh, based on this. Now, the Athenians, we often think of philosophy and democracy, and then Spartans, in fact, even the word Spartan means stoic. It means simplicity. It means practical. You know, these guys were taught to discourage outside thinking, taught to discourage emotion. You know, um, one popular Spartan phrase was, come home carrying your shield or being carried on it. So the clip you're watching was from the movie 300. Again, not at all historically accurate, but lots of these folks embellish. But what you're seeing is um, uh, kind of a journey from boyhood to manhood for a Spartan.
So back to the hoplites and the phalanx. I wanted to show you guys an example of this. So again, here's the movie Troy, but we're just going to watch a second of it. And this is Achilles um, talking to his soldiers. And each of these boats uh, comprised of a phalanx. So they were a unit or a platoon that could work together as a team. And so in just a moment, you're going to see them jump off the ship and form up with shields and spears. And they're going to effectively storm a beach um, with just one boat. Now, granted, it's a movie. It's embellished. This probably wouldn't work out in real life. Uh, but at least we can get an example of what the phalanx looked like. So these men, and the important concept here is they're hoplites which is the Greek word for citizen soldier. You know, so many people in the ancient world had bronze weapons. Well, bronze was incredibly hard to find, making it very expensive. But in the Greek tradition, using iron weapons, anyone could become a soldier. And so these were people amongst common citizens who had been trained in the art of war could be called upon when necessary. So kind of like a, uh, an army reserves, if you will. Yeah, so there's the phalanx being employed. Do you think that the, the Greeks could have influenced the Vikings for their shield wall or any other? That's a good question. I mean, uh, the Romans picked this up. Um, they And we'll talk more about them next week. Um, they called it tortosa, which is just the Latin word for, uh, well, now we use tortoise. Um, so it very much is. Like uh, they, they had rectangular shields, but when they formed up like that, they could form a rectangular shield wall. Um, you know, some at the top holding the ceiling and then others holding the walls. And they fought together as these units. Um, so really the political repercussions we're talking about here is that while amongst many ancient peoples using bronze, only the very wealthy and elite could serve and fight and even have access to weapons or armor. But with iron, it changes everything. So. All right, moving on. Um, by 750 BCE, uh, the Greek world uh, had become rather populated. And there were a number of these city-states all over the Mediterranean. So now I wanted to look into the city-state of Athens just a little bit. Um, the city-state of Athens dates back to 700 BCE. And by this point, they had established a polis on the peninsula of Attica. So Athens is the city-state, Attica is the region. Now, previously, the city-state had been ruled by a king and a number of wealthy aristocrats who were powerful landowners. And meanwhile, the average Athenian farmer was deeply in debt. And if they couldn't pay their debts, they could be sold into slavery. It's odd how a lot of Athenian history uh, mirrors American history. Um, so this practice of debt slavery, uh, which was commonplace in Athens, was eventually outlawed uh, by a man named Cleisthenes. Debt peonage, um, which is what we call it in the United States, was not actually outlawed until 1913. Um, so these farmers were struggling. They couldn't pay their debts. They were being sold into slavery. This was causing a lot of political unrest um, because when an honest person can't make a living, that's not a good sign for a society. And so Solon uh, came to reform and, and fix a lot of these things. For one, he began by canceling all debts 
So to cancel all debts means that either the government is going to buy all of those debts or they're going to abolish the entire financial system and then start anew. Uh, secondly, he outlawed any new debts based on human collateral. So of course, when you buy a house or you buy a car um, or you take out a second mortgage, uh, the concern of the bank is what happens if you can't pay? You know, if it's a house, they can repossess your house. If it's a car, they take your car back. That's your collateral. And what Solon outlawed is previously people have been saying, loan me money and if I can't pay it back, I'll work for you. And then before you know it, they're sold into slavery. He went so far as to not only cancel debt, not only outlaw the practice altogether, but in fact he redistributed land in an equal way so that everyone had a farmable tract of land. I mean, effectively, he's imposing communism. So, rather extreme. But of course, the problems have become extreme. So that's what we see in societies. When problems become severe, people look towards severe solutions. But then you'll also see the spectrum bounce back. So that's what, exactly what, uh, and I'm going to butcher his name, Pisa Stratus, uh, when he seized power, um, he restored some old practices, focused more on business and trade. Uh, but then when Chrysothenes seized power, um, he carried many of these reforms forward. In fact, it's with the reign of Chrysothenes that we really consider the beginning of Athenian democracy. First off, he formed a Council of 500. Um, this would be very much like the United States Congress, um, although we only have 435 congressmen. They have 500 representatives for a city-state, which granted represented a, an empire, um, but they would have roughly the same amount of land as North Carolina. So maybe you could call this the General Assembly. So Council of 500 um, that would oversee foreign affairs, uh, policy, spending, taxation, etc. But any of these meetings were open to the public. Any Athenian citizen could come and participate in these debates. Um, the only problem with this is very similar to the problem that we see at the beginning of American history. Yay, freedom and justice for all. Well, what's a citizen? Who could vote in early American history? No. Yes, um, you had to be white, you had to be male, you had to own property. Um, who could vote in Athenian history? You had to be Greek, you had to be born there, that was the only difference, and then you had to own property. So you had to be Greek, you had to be born there, you had to own property. So that means, yes, democracy, but that's also why the last bullet says there are severe restrictions because that excludes most of the population. So, when we talk about Greece, there is a modern nation of Greece. They are the nation state of Greece, comprised of many of these same islands we're talking about. Um, but when we're talking ancient Greece, they mostly fought amongst themselves. The only unifying factor was their language and their culture. There are a couple of cases where they work together. And the, the two most famous are the two Persian invasions. So by the time of the first Persian invasion, Greece had already become a tributary of the Persian Empire, meaning they were paying taxes, they submitted to them, they obeyed Persian law. Uh, but the Greeks never seemed to like being told what to do. And so on two major occasions, they rebelled. And a powerful empire like Persia cannot allow a tiny little place like Greece to rebel and get, a look, get away with it. And so they invaded on two occasions. Both occasions, the Greeks won. So the first of these was decided in a battle called Marathon. And yes, that's where the race comes from because a runner named Pheidippides carried the message of victory from the battle all the way to Athens just so happened to be 26.2 miles 
and then he shouted out when he got to Athens, according to the legend, again, probably made up, it's probably a lie, but according to the legend, he got to Athens and he yelled Nike, which is Greek for victory. Yes, those guys named themselves after the Greek word for victory. So anyway, the Greeks fought off the Persian invasion. But it wouldn't be long until there would be a second Persian invasion with a much larger army, much more organized, a much more brutal king called Xerxes. And this is the one Herodotus writes about as the army of five million. It was a terrible threat to the Greeks. Whether they were five million or not, probably not, but probably a large army, you know, well over 100,000. So, in a series of several battles, the first of which has always been my favorite, uh, the Battle of Thermopylae. So, since the Greek coast is so mountainous, uh, like think of the picture of the whitewashed walls, there aren't too many ideal harbors. You know, there's a major port in Athens, but you can't just land in the middle of a city because um, you'll be slaughtered. Uh, so, there weren't too many excellent beachheads. But there was one near a beach called Thermopylae. The only problem with Thermopylae is when you land there to get to the mainland, you have to pass through a narrow canyon. It was called the Hot Gates. And it was in this narrow canyon um, that a Spartan army of just 300 warriors stood. Now, you'll hear of, there's a movie called 300. You'll hear of the last stand of the 300. It's a very famous story. The reality is not quite as glamorous. There were actually about 5,000 warriors. So there were 300 Spartans. There were also Laconians, there were Thespians. There were people of various city-states working with the Spartans. But when it became obvious they were gonna lose, the Spartans sent the rest of them away. So they volunteered to hold the rear guard. And the 300 stood and fought to the death. And, and it's a very famous story in Greek history and there was a very famous king who fought to the death with the Spartans named Leonidas. Uh, his name means lion in Greek. Um, so whether or not the battle had strategic significance or not, it has a very symbolic one. And, and it probably did buy the Greeks enough time to organize because even though the Persians did force the gate and even though the army did get through, the Greeks had rallied enough of an army to, in a couple of battles, culminating with the Battle of Plataea, finally defeat the Persian invaders. So let's explore this idea of democracy in a little more depth. And let's also look at what's considered the high point of ancient Greek history. So Athens and Sparta led the two victories against the Persian invasions. And so it stands to reason that Athens and Sparta would lead the peace. And the two Persian invasions represent a rare time where the Greeks came together to fight a common foe. And after the second invasion, the Greeks realized that if they went right back to fighting amongst themselves, they wouldn't stand a chance if there were a third time. And so they formed a confederacy an alliance called the Delian League. And it was simply a defensive alliance. So it's nothing like a Greek nation. But we will see that later. This was simply an agreement. That if the bad guys came again, we would work together. However, Athens was the wealthiest and most powerful and most populated of all the city-states in the Delian League. And so they grew to dominate this league. And they began to rule over it almost as an empire, not in name, but in practice. But it's during this time known as the high point of Greek history or, or the classical era of Greek history that this famous leader, Pericles, um, came to power. And he expanded democracy, allowing Athenian citizens to vote. Um, he created the School of Greece um, where, you know, many famous uh, Greek teachers and philosophers uh, dwell. And so this is the time of Socrates, and Plato, and Aristotle, and Aristophanes, and um, 
Epicurus and, and so many of these great philosophers that you'll hear and read about uh, came from this golden era of Greek history. But like so many golden eras, it was doomed to end eventually. And it did. You know, Athens got to be so wealthy and prominent because they were dominating the other city-states. They were using the Delian League to their advantage. But the Spartans had the most powerful army in all of Greece. And they felt they should get to be the boss. I mean, they're the strongest, therefore they should be the boss. And so eventually they challenged Athens for dominance. And this became the famous Peloponnesian War. So Athens had the naval advantage going into the war because they, they had the stronger navy, they had more ships because they had the wealth to make. Sparta, meanwhile, had the more powerful army. Athens knew that if they left their city walls and faced the Spartans in open battle, they'd lose. And so they hid behind their walls. But when you have a large population contained in a small space, even with modern technology, disease is bound to break out. And of course, in the ancient world, this was all too common. And so they didn't know what it was called. I mean, it could have been COVID, it could have been dysentery, it could have been who knows what. They called it the plague. And so you'll find most ancient peoples suffer from the plague at some point in their history. Because it really just means a lot of them got sick and died, and nobody really knew what. And so what makes matters worse and if you look back to the last major pandemic that we experienced, which was the Spanish flu, what made that so terrible is that it began during the First World War. Wars make the spread of disease much worse. And so soldiers were giving each other the Spanish flu in the trenches and they were bringing it home and it was spreading. And by the end, it had killed 30 million people. So that's why we've been so careful with COVID because that was the last major example. So um, during this plague, which actually killed more people than the war itself, uh, roughly a third of the population of Athens died. In fact, the famous statesman Pericles died. And while the fighting eventually concluded with the surrender of Athens, victory for Sparta, the result was a Pyrrhic victory, meaning everybody lost. The plague killed tons of people. The wars killed tons of people, cost them immense amounts of money. And so, in fact, the war continued for 70 more years. So while Sparta technically had the victory, it's gonna be the collapse of both civilizations for a time. So let's look at what came out of this classical era of Greek history. So the two most famous writers, Herodotus and Thucydides, we've already talked about. Uh, there were a number of playwrights. Uh, the Greeks invented um, the play. So if ever you know anybody who uh, maybe works with the drama department here at Blue Ridge or has, has been involved with drama um, at the high school, uh, actors sometimes refer to themselves as thespians. And it's just the Greek word for actor. Well, really, it's a Greek city-state. And it was the Greek city-state of Thespius that the tradition of the play began. And I'm just going to tell you one of the more famous stories. Um, there are so many, um, but you're probably familiar with the story of Oedipus Rex. And if not, well, it's a bit of a twisted story. Uh, but what's fun about Greek stories is you'll find them retconned in so many um, modern stories. So anyway, I'll give you the short version. So Oedipus was born of a wealthy mother and father who were powerful kings of a city-state. But a dark prophecy followed his birth, that one day he would kill his father and he would marry his mother. And his parents were disturbed. They were like, oh my gosh, you know, we got to get rid of this baby. And, you know, Snow White copied some of the stories. So they said, hey, you, hunter guy, go take this baby out and kill it. You know, which is also how Snow White starts. But just like Snow White, the hunter couldn't bring himself to kill a baby. So what did he do? He fled. And he raised the baby as his own. Never told the baby of his true identity. Took him as far away from the city as he could. 
and eventually Oedipus grew to be a man. Well, he was a heroic man. He was a fighter. He was an adventurer. And he had done many great things and already become <clears throat> rather famous. But he heard of something horrible going on in a city nearby. Sure enough, there was a monster attacking the city. I mean, this is Greek mythology. So a monster attacking the city. They needed a hero to come save them. So Oedipus was the man for the job. So sure enough, he goes to this city to slay the monster. Well, on the way, he gets into a wreck. I don't know if he crashes horses or chariots or wagons or whatever, but he gets into a wreck. Both people survive, but they're very mad at each other, like sometimes people are in car wrecks. The two wound up fighting. Weapons were drawn. Oedipus killed the man. And then went on to the city. Fought the monster, slayed the monster, became super famous, even, you know, bigger of a hero than he was previously. He became so famous that they made him the king. And his reward would be to marry the queen. She married the queen, the two fell in love, they had all the babies. And then later, the man who had raised him came back and told him his real story. And sure enough, the person in the wreck was his father and the beautiful queen was his mother. And so like all good Greek tragedies, he didn't take the news very well. She didn't take the news very well. Um, he dug his eyes out with knives and she threw herself into an oven. So anyway, that's Oedipus. Um, you know, there's way more to it, but that's the short version. Um, so in the arts, uh, Greek architecture and sculpture have been very influential. And so you'll st still see examples of these in the modern era. But I wanted to spend some time with Greek philosophy. And we'll start with Socrates. So Socrates was famous for asking questions. In fact, the Socratic method is a form of teaching where you just ask someone questions. It's another, it's a form of argument too. You know, you can why someone right to death. What that means is that you're getting to the root of their argument by simply asking them questions. It's a really fun way to argue, you know, because most people aren't listening when they're arguing, but if they're asking, if you're asking them questions, you're forcing them to think through their own ideas. And if you're very clever with it, you can actually change someone's mind through doing nothing but asking questions. Socrates was the master at this. And his goal in education, he believed, was to improve the individual. So this is where the philosophy of humanities courses come in. You know, um, if I were teaching welding, you know, the outcome would be hopefully you could weld. If I were teaching a foreign language, then hopefully by the end, you would have some familiarity with the foreign language. But I'm teaching history. Well, what's the outcome? <laughs> You know, you're not just going to become history. You're not just going to do history. What is it? What's the goal of history? And the goal is wisdom that we learn from all of these people in all of these places. We get a better understanding of the world and of ourselves. And, and that's what Socrates believed education was all about. But in addition to wisdom, he believed that part of wisdom is critical thinking, is questioning of authority. In fact, he was later condemned to death by the city of Athens for asking too many questions. Um, I mean, I would have loved to have meet, met this guy, but he probably would have annoyed the tar out of him. Just asking tons of questions. Finally, the city just had enough with this, and they brought him to trial. And they said, I'll tell you what, you are corrupting the youth of Athens. You're teaching all these kids to ask questions, and they're driving all their parents nuts. We are done with it. Because um, what he was also doing was teaching people to question conventional belief systems. You know, just because you were taught this from birth, does that make it true? And so when more and more people began asking this, the Athenians grew angry, and they gave them a choice. You can leave the city of Athens forever and live in peace, or you can choose execution. And Socrates said, I'm nothing if not Athenian. He chose his own manner of execution drank a horrible poison known as wormwood and died. 
He had a student named Plato, who had a student named Aristotle, and they also um, developed the basis for modern philosophy. So Plato wrote one of the best explorations of every political system you can think of. So he gave an excellent treatment to democracy, to a republic, to a dictatorship, to a monarchy, etc., etc. And in the end, after he had evaluated every one of these in his book, The Republic, he said, you know which one I like the best? Because he's an Athenian. He said, it's not actually the system I live in. He believed, and he said, this is probably never going to happen. But what if there was a king who was also a philosopher, who was also already rich enough that he didn't want anything, and he just ruled out of the kindness of his heart, and he only ever made wise decisions? He said, if such a thing could be, that would be the ideal form of government. But he also acknowledges it's like, come on, like never going to happen. Aristotle was more of a scientist. And without a microscope, without a telescope, he wrote about the basic elements of human life. You know, he was the one who felt that everything was comprised of either earth, air, water, fire, or ether. So he only had five elements. Granted, what we've got is 30 something in the periodic table, but um, I can't remember the exact number. But anyway, we have a lot more than five. He believed there were only five. Ether is just the substance of things we can't see. You know, you can't grab the air. You can't actually see it. So he called that ether. Um, again, most, most of his ideas have been debunked. Uh, but the fact that he tried to develop a systematic understanding of the world, uh, a system of physics with no technology, is still profound. You know, he wrote and tried to guess at what makes the planets move. You know, of course, now we know it's gravity. At the time, he thought that there was the Earth, and then there was the second heaven, which is what we see, the sky, and then there was the third heaven. Um, so, in fact, in the New Testament, I can't remember which epistle Paul writes of being caught up to the third heaven. And that's what he's referring to, is this Greek concept of what's outside the world. And Aristotle believed that what's outside the world are the planets and the stars. And they're actually divine. And they're perfect. And what makes them move? Uh, he believed that they were being pulled on chariots by angelic beings. No concept of gravity, but points for trying. So Greek religion is a lot of fun to talk about as well. So, Greeks didn't think of religion in the same way that we do. Um, they had 12 gods who they believed dwelt on Mount Olympus, but they had no real body of doctrine or morality. You know, if you read about Greek mythology, they were all sleeping around. Occasionally, they hated and tried to kill each other. Um, there's all kinds of juicy drama. I mean, the gods were up to all the nonsense that we are as people. So... What are they supposed to get out of that? Well, there's ritual, festivities to honor the gods and goddesses. Um, there's peace. You know, they could consult the oracle at Delphi if they had questions, and the oracle would claim to speak through the gods and provide them with answers. And there was stability. It was a civic religion that the Greeks believed was simply necessary for the well-being of the state. That religion has a unifying factor, a means of forming community. And so the Greeks saw it for a little more than what it was. So 
What was daily life like? So Plato wrote that the ideal size for a city-state should be no more than 40,000 citizens. And he probably wrote that because at the time of his writing, Athens had close to 40,000 citizens. But remember that citizen doesn't mean human. Citizen means Greek, native-born, male property owner. In fact, there were about 150,000 people, but out of those, only the 40,000 had any kind of voting power. Uh, the economy is based on agriculture because the world was based on ag agriculture, uh, but the Greeks were notable for their overseas international trade. Um, women did hold a traditional role, uh, but I think it is neat to mention um, that the Greeks didn't have uh, the historical sexual hang-ups that a lot of the Judeo-Christian world has. Um, homosexuality, bisexuality were just commonplace in Greek culture. So I wanted to show you um, one of the stories from Greek philosophy, and this is the story of the cave. You know, Socrates told of a cave with a brilliant light in the background and that everyone else was facing away from the brilliant light looking into the darkness but that true knowledge requires a rejection of the darkness that we are currently seeing and a turning to the light and that metaphor can mean so many different things you know he believed the light was knowledge he believed the darkness was the drudgery of our normal lives. So here's the Parthenon. Um, this is the famous Temple of Athena. Um, this is what's left of it. There's actually a scale replica, scale meaning built to size, in Nashville, Tennessee. So it's really cool. Uh, an example of Greek sculpture. You know, this is an example of a relief. Um, meaning, well, not a relief, but a mosaic. Uh, each of these are little stones with individual paintings that make a larger picture. And this mosaic is from the Roman city of Pompeii. So here's a map of the Peloponnesian War. Um, you can just see the various city-states vying for power. Um, the red here is Sparta, and the yellow or orange uh, would be Athens, and then the green would be neutral territories. We don't have much time left, but I want to give you the short version of Alexander the Conqueror, Alexander the Great. Uh, his father, Philip II of Macedon, managed to conquer all the Greeks and unite the Greek-speaking world until he was assassinated. And then his son, Alexander, assumed power at a very young age and continued his father's work, put down other rebellions, and within a few years had once again united the Greek-speaking world. And then he set about to conquer Persia and did it. And then conquered Egypt and then conquered and continued his campaign as far as the Indus River Valley and then turned around. His army said they would fight no more and they wanted to go home. And on the way home, which at this point was Babylon, he had conquered um, everything and made Babylon his capital. Uh, he grew sick on the journey home and he died in his capital city. But his empire fell apart within a few decades. One of the greatest conquerors in the world, but his realm didn't last. And while his realm didn't
and last. He's still one of the most famous figures in ancient history. Not because of his political influence or his military prowess, but because of the cultural influence of bringing the Greeks and Greek culture to the ancient world. And not just making everyone Greek, but blending Greek with other cultures. And this is called Hellenism um, from the main Greek land called the Hellespont. Hellenism is the blending of Greek with so many other places and cultures. So there is a political element. He did conquer an empire, and his generals divided up the empire into four parts, but eventually those parts would declare their independence. And so culture, we've discussed philosophy, we've discussed a little bit of science, um, so we'll move on. Wanted to close just by looking at the impact of these people on the world. You know, much of our language comes from Greek, half of our language comes from Latin, and, and Greco-Roman culture are going to be blended and are going to spread even more prominently. 
and 